Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. I have informed the Prime Minister and the leadership of the Liberal Party caucus that I will be sitting as an independent. MP Han Dong's surprising resignation from Liberal caucus after Global News reported that he allegedly advised a Chinese official to delay the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. Dong has denied these allegations and says he intends to clear his name, but his resignation has prompted more calls for a public inquiry. It has become very clear now with allegations coming out on a daily basis that are continuing to erode people's confidence in our democracy that we need a public inquiry. So what's to be made of this resignation? How does this affect the calls for a public inquiry? Let's bring in everybody. Chantelle Bear, Althea Raj, Andrew Coyne, and joining us tonight, our Washington uh, correspondent, senior correspondent, Alex Panetta, who's in Canada for the, the big visit, which we will get to. But we, we <laughs> want to start with this news because it is um, significant and, and, a, and a pretty big deal for the government. And Chantelle, I'll start with you. How surprising was this to you? And what do you think this does to the story and the government's attempt to manage the story? Okay, there are uh, many moving parts in your question. First of all, I think it's probably proper to talk about allegations rather than revelations. That's right. Why do I say that? Because the, this story is based on anonymous sources that would be associated with the security services, but we don't know who exactly they are and how solid uh, their information is, for one. For two, we have recent experience that uh, suggests caution uh, when looking at intelligence material, is very recent. Uh, mm -hmm. And the leaks that came from the security services about uh, what uh, justified uh, him ending up tortured uh, in Syria. And, uh, of course, the 20th anniversary this week of the war on Iraq and the quest for weapons of mass destruction. So it's not just small countries with f funky security services mm -hmm. that sometimes throw in false information into the mix. Big boys and big girls also do it. What does it do to the story? I think it almost makes inevitable the holding of a public inquiry. Mm -hmm. It has given the issue momentum uh, if it ever needed any. Uh, I can't see how David Johnston, if he goes to uh, May 23rd to make a recommendation, could uh, avoid recommending a public inquiry. Yeah, I, I wonder too, Althea, whether that's sort of what the government would almost be hoping for at this stage, because obviously things need to be uh, put on the table so that we understand, as, as Chantal says, the pieces we know or we think we know and the pieces that we don't know um, and understand what's, what's real in all of it. Yeah, I mean, I will start off, I guess, with a note of caution, like Chantal. Like, I really hope that my media colleagues are getting this right, because I was... Uh, so moved by Han Dong breaking down uh, in the House of Commons as he did last night when he was talking to his family members. Like, if this man is lying, give him an Oscar because that was a great performance. Um, you really feel like his world is, is shattering. And I hope that the sources whose intelligence the global report is based on um, are is accurate uh, because somebody's reputation has been completely torn to tatters and I don't know how he manages to put how he gets to manage to, to put the pieces together with regards to the public inquiry uh, I feel like so many people believe that this is the answer and I'm not I feel like even if we get a public inquiry, they will be disappointed because this mm -hmm. information, if this is based on wiretap information, as we believe that it likely is uh, from the, the consul general in, in Toronto, um, that's not going to be discussed out in the open. You know, there will be very little information publicly discussed. So we will have mm -hmm. to wait uh, for the commissioner to come out and people will have to believe that what happened behind closed doors was a fair, legitimate process that shed light. I just... I don't know if we will have more questions rather than answers at the end of all of this. Andrew? Uh, I'll also say we should be skeptical, but skepticism shouldn't edge into denial. If you watch some of the reaction online, people either wanted to arrest him forthwith or they said this is an utter travesty and a, and a calumny on a good man. I don't think we know either of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we do know is it's not only his reputation that's on the line, but so is the reputation of Global and the reporter in question. And people need to understand that news organizations I take these things pretty seriously and they don't just throw out allegations without, you know, just for kicks. This would have been checked sideways, you know, up, down, and sideways and lawyered and everything else. Doesn't mean it's necessarily right, 
but it does mean it's credible enough that we should take it seriously and would, should want to know more. And that's what I think it seems to me everybody should be able to agree on is uh, there's obviously something out there we need to learn more about. A public inquiry may be the best way of getting at it, but certainly, again, I'll repeat this point. What we really need to know is what was known inside the government about all of this and what was done or not done about any of it. Alex, obviously you're, you're a U.S. reporter, but you're following this because the concerns around China um, obviously exist in the United States as well. Well, I was going to say that if this story is accurate, it's one of the great scandals in Canadian political history. If this story is inaccurate, it's one of the great scandals in Canadian political history. And, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the Washington context here is, is, is quite striking. I mean, to have this story break... Uh, and to be on the front pages of newspapers in the hotels where uh, American guests will be staying uh, is pretty bad timing uh, for the government. Very awkward because I, I could not stress enough the extent to which the United States is obsessed with China right now. J just for context, today, uh, the, President Biden's visit to Canada is not a big story in the United States. Mm -hmm. What is happening on Capitol Hill today are three Count them three hearings related to China. There's the TikTok hearing, the uh, CEO of the social media company, where they're looking at banning TikTok. There is uh, something on Uyghur genocide happening on Capitol Hill. And uh, they're looking at um, uh, a, a third, uh, there's a third China investigation happening as well. So all these things are happening at the same time. And it just shows you that the United States is just, it, it dominates every single conversation about policy and is a, a matter of bi, uh, bipartisan uh, concern there. So now Canada's you know, made the news there probably for reasons it wishes it hadn't. Chantal. Uh, we have also uh, been increasingly dominated by the China question. Let's not forget that uh, the, the, the two Michaels were not brought home uh, 10 years ago. That mm -hmm. just happened and it overshadowed uh, Justin Trudeau's not only his, his China policy, but his term in office as prime minister. It was part and parcel of it, which is part of the reason why the story about the uh, this MP, it's difficult to get one's head around. Uh, mm -hmm. What Liberal MP would not think that it would be a good day on any day of the week for the two Michaels to come home? Uh, a good day for the government. But setting that aside, the U.S. has chimed in to our story via the ambassador. Uh, and I'm sorry to mention a competitor, but in a CTV interview, uh, which uh, ambassadors do not give unless they have a message, uh, the message from the U.S. ambassador to Canada was, what matters is that the inter interference work, and in my book, he said, it didn't work. Uh, yeah. So uh, those attempts were all living with them. I thought it was interesting because that interview came in the middle of this discussion, but also in the lead up to the presidential visit. Uh, last word to you on this, Andrew. I'm not sure I agree with the ambassador that the only thing that matters is whether they actually worked or not. If people are trying to rob your bank, uh, it's not really hugely uh, um, you know, reassuring to know that, well, they didn't succeed this time, but they're still, gonna, they're still trying. Uh, there's clearly a large-scale operation out there. That's not in contention. We've been talking about this for years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so far, we've been able to withstand it. But I think we need to, to be sure that our, our defenses are secure. Welcome back to another round of that issue. Joe Biden has arrived in Ottawa for his official meeting with the Prime Minister. The President and Prime Minister are set to discuss a number of topics during the visit, including defence spending, Haiti and the border. Radio Canada has confirmed a deal has been reached to close the Roxham Road irregular crossing. In return, Canada will allow 15,000 more migrants to enter legally. So what other problems might get solved in this visit? How important is it? Let's bring everyone back. Chantal, Althea, Andrew, and joining us tonight, Alex Panetta. Alex, let's start with you, because you uh, you helped confirm some of these details first reported by our, our friend Louis Blouin. But um, the fact that there is seems to be a deal, obviously they still have to sign it tomorrow, but uh, that seems to me to be a, a big deal <laughs> because it was something Canada was uh, looking for, for sure. It's for years. These talks were yeah. dormant. I, I was talking to someone today who said, had you asked me, someone very involved in this, uh, said, if you asked me a month ago, I would have said this would not happen. It would never happen. Uh, I, I spoke just a few weeks ago with people from the United States, from Canada, saying these things were going nowhere. And, and uh, contextually, it's important to keep in mind the United States, when it hears that ca Canada is having a problem with thousands of uh, asylum <laughs> seekers, it's like, well, sorry, we're talking millions. 
you know, three extra zeros uh, uh, in the United States. And, and, you know, they could have said, poor little pumpkin, you can't handle a small little um, a spike in migration in the midst of a historic worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but they didn't say that. Apparently, they, 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 took, they took this request from Canada to negotiate this in, the, in advance of President Biden's trip quite seriously. And my understanding is, barring some spectacular uh, reversal or last minute snafu, uh, there's going to be an announcement tomorrow uh, to extend the safe third country agreement across the border um, in exchange for, as you correctly noted, uh, uh, Canada taking in an additional 15,000 migrants from the Western uh, Hemisphere. And it should take effect within uh, days, potentially. And, and that, Chantal, will certainly make, I, I think, the Quebec Premier quite happy because he is the one that's been struggling with this problem the most. Yes, uh, for sure. It, it, we're not so much closing Roxham Road as allowing uh, the RCMP and the police to turn back people who show up at Roxham Road and uh, ending this, this fast way to get into Canada irregularly. Uh, it's more, uh, I think President Biden found some cover in the more recent focus on people going the other way from Canada to the US, which allows him to say, well, I've plugged the border. But I'm, it is, at the end of the day, more of a gift to Justin Trudeau than, than a win for Joe Biden. And I'm curious to see when the meetings end, whether we have traded something in exchange, like mm -hmm. acceptance mm -hmm. uh, on 80 to lead a multinational force in that country, yeah. which we've been reluctant to do. But I, I am convinced that the quid pro quo extends beyond accepting 15,000 more migrants uh, from South uh, uh, and the American uh, continent. Yeah, I, I would I would imagine you're quite right, Chantal. Andrew, what, what, what would you imagine, well, first of all, the deal, but what would you imagine could be on the table for what the United States might be able to get out of Canada? Uh, I don't know. I think Chantal is absolutely right that 15,000 uh, migrants from Mexico seems like a fairly small price to be paid for resolving such a problem. I guess my question is, how much does this actually resolve? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, the, the, the premise here is that we can patrol a 5,000-mile border. You know, people are showing up at Roxham Road because they were turned back at the official crossing points. If they're no longer going to be allowed to cross at Roxham Road, presumably they're going to cross somewhere else. Only now we won't know who they are, where they are, which may, to be cynical, maybe part of the point is that at least they'll be off the front pages. We, we won't know where they are, but they won't be clogging up Roxham Road and, and creating, you know, upsetting images on the nightly news. So there's the enforceability question. There's also the question of... Uh, how long is the safe third country agreement going to be uh, legal in Canada? Because there are court challenges out there, and we may well find eventually when it gets to the Supreme Court uh, that this gets thrown out as being not constitutional because we can't necessarily be sure that the United States is indeed a safe third country. Uh, and that ultimately, as long as there's this gap in reality or perception between how migrants are treated in Canada and how they're treated in the United States, then I think we're always going to have this problem with us. Althea? Yeah, well, the Supreme Court has already heard the case, but we don't have a date on when they're going to actually yeah. issue their ruling. But um, Andrew's very quite right. It will take the issue away from the front pages, at least um, in Quebec, in the sense that the, that number of 15,000 will be spread across official border crossings and will not cause uh, great images uh, to arise in people's supper hour uh, newscast. Um, I'm not, I don't quite think that, I would be very surprised, I guess I should say, if uh, the Canadian government agrees to lead a multinational force in Haiti. I don't, I think there's going to be an outcome in Haiti. That's what we've been told from both sides of the border. Um, but that would be very surprising. I think maybe what we've traded is a lot more defense spending. There's been a lot of talk from the Americans about wanting us to spend more money on NORAD modernization. Um, it's great that we're buying F-35s, but the infrastructure in the Arctic is not uh, up to par in order to have F-35 guys up there. Um, so we know that there's going to be a lot of announcements. They have been working on this for weeks. Action-oriented announcement is what they told us. Um, but I think just taking a step back, I think the story that is going to come out tomorrow is really about the friendships between mm. these two men and, and, and how positive that has been for Canada. And the Safe Third Country Agreement is proof of that. Though, though not not a quote unquote bromance as as the way the the Trudeau Obama uh, relationship was depicted, Alex, and certainly not a relationship without without issues, um, because Biden is you know he wants to presumably become president again. Absolutely, and so I, I want to pick up on something Chantal said. She talked yeah. about the Republicans making an issue of migration from Canada. I think they may have unwittingly um, or unintentionally led to this agreement. I think they created political space for Joe Biden to say. 
yes to Canada on this. And, and he'll be able to now say, look, I closed the Canadian border. You've been complaining about hundreds or thousands of migrants from Canada. I've, I've shut that off. And, but, but I have to say, Biden himself, through the course of his presidency, there, some Canadians will disagree that he's been good for Canada because they'll, you know, depending on your priorities, they'll say he canceled the Keystone Pipeline. You may disagree with that and think it was a, a terrible decision. But recently, in the last, in the last year, he has, I won't say expended political capital because these aren't huge issues in the United States. I'll say he's risked political capital because they could become issues in the United States twice for Canada on that electric vehicle tax credit. Yeah. Uh, Buy American policies are exceptionally popular. He got a bipartisan standing ovation during the State of the Union address talking about Buy uh, by American issues. He's now said, I'll make an exception for Canada and Mexico. And lately, it might also be Europe, depending on how the regulations are written. So he did Canada a favor there. More recently, I don't think this thing is a political winner necessarily for him. As a matter of fact, it's probably a lot more risk than reward. Yet he's done Canada a solid, or at least done the Canadian government a solid because it was asking for this. So, uh, yeah, I'd say Biden uh, over the last year has, has, has taken a risk twice on issues important to, uh, to the Canadians. Chantal? I think the vast majority of Canadians, based on polls, feel that he's in any way totally better than the alternative or his recent predecessor. I think that's a no contest. Canada has always uh, been more uh, favorable to Democrat presidents. I think that holds true for Biden. I'm not so sure that it was that big a give to Canada, uh, the, the, the move on uh, allowing Canada and Mexico to be part of the, the yeah. e-vehicle uh, umbrella in the sense that those are integrated uh, manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the pressures to do that were coming from the United States and, and car makers in the United States and the industry in the U.S. as much as from Canada. But I also think we've upped our game over the Trump years yeah. and we no longer just rely on bromances to advance our files. Very quickly, Andrew. Uh, I'll just come back to Chantel's point about uh, uh, larger deals. Nations don't have friends that only interests. It's great that they get along, but there will be quid pro quo. And uh, if the prime minister owes him one, then he owes him one. And we'll have to see what that, what that, uh, what the payment is. Althea, like 20 seconds. Well, I was just struck by one line in the briefing yesterday uh, from the U.S. side, which was Canada's prosperity is America's prosperity. And you could not, I agree with Chantal about the hard ball. I think we've learned to play hard ball during the yeah. Donald Trump years, but it, you know, Politics is about personality, and at the end, another president saying that would have been uh, unimaginable a few years ago. Thank you all. That was a good uh, prep for the, the big day tomorrow. Good to have you here, Alex, and good to see everyone else. I'll see the three of you for the budget on Tuesday.